to Speak for Yourself. I'm Joy Taylor here with LeVar Arrington and Rick Buecher. What's up, guys? Marcella Swiley and Emmanuel Acho are off today, so but we're going to keep it moving, starting in Dallas. Dak Prescott has not taken a snap this preseason, but according to reports, he's expected to be a full go for the regular season opener against the Bucks. So it looks like he'll play, but Adam Schefter reports he may not be 100% all season as he recovers from last year's ankle injury and his current shoulder strain. So, LeVar, what are your expectations for Dak Prescott this season? Well, Joe, I, I think my expectations for Dak is to make it through the season, to not only make it through the season, but to take steps forward in, in a positive manner. Uh, he's a veteran now. He knows what it is to, to be a, a professional football player. He understands what it is to prepare as one as well. Now, with, with a major injury taking place, there will be questions of how high a level can he, you know, can he play at, but... I don't think that that's something that we should uh, condemn him at this point. I think that you look at what Dak is bringing to the table. I think that they've been very responsible in terms of how they've approached uh, him coming back and his rehab process. So I look at him as, as being able to come back and play at a level that's been higher than the level that he's played at before. And not so much where you look at it in the, the, the stats like, he threw for a lot. He was up there with, with you know, he was the highest uh, average in yards per game before he got injured. But I look at it more so from a substance standpoint of the leadership, the, the ability to win games. And that's where I think that he'll take a, a major step forward, where I think he makes a difference that way. LeVar, way to set those expectations right through the roof. I think he's going to make roof? it through the season. Yes. Wow. That, I mean, yeah, okay. You're being I, sarcastic. All right. I, I like it. Would, I was expecting a little bit more. I just expected you to go a little more with, with more guns. Okay. I am going to say it's going to be a star-crossed season because it has been a star-crossed season so far. It's been a star-crossed a star training camp. He comes in. The ankle looks good. Everybody's excited. And then... He strains his shoulder and his uh, a, sho a muscle in his shoulder, and now suddenly he can't throw. Uh, I, I, every step of the way, it seems one step forward, two steps back, and I would expect that that's going to happen both for Dak Prescott and the Cowboys in general. Are we going to see flashes of the old da Dak Prescott that uh, earned him that big contract? I would expect so, yes. But is it going to be enough to put the Cowboys over the top? There were huge expectations put on him with that contra contract and what he was able, going to be able to do for the Cowboys this season, and they are off completely on the wrong foot. He comes out jacked up, excited, wants to show that things are different, and strains his shoulder. And then he gets healthy enough to throw again, and we're pre-Texans game, and he throws, and Mike McCarthy hears about how much he threw, and he's like, oh, that's too much. I mean, he can't help himself at this point. He wants so badly to make up for lost time that he's not going about it the right way, and I dare say the Cowboys aren't either. What's the good of having all this medical information and the sports medicine and the biometrics when you can't keep the guy in the parameters that he's supposed to be in coming back? So I I'm being Behind in saying star-crossed. Oh, it wow. could potentially be a disaster, but I'll go with star-crossed for now, considering ah, we got the big star the in the big dig. Come on, Joy. Get I mean, it's right. not, I don't think it's hating. I, I kind of agree with oh. him. I mean, it's, look, he's going to play. We know that, but he's not going to be 100%. And LeVar, you know, you don't want to come into the season. What's the saying? Come into the season injured, leave the season injured. Injuries are an inevitability in this sport, but you don't want to come into the regular season injured. And let's be honest. Tell him, like, Joy. We, he's injured. Like, it, this, is not, this is not whatever the Cowboys are trying to say. Don't worry. It's not a setback. Nothing's happening over here. It is happening. Otherwise, he would be playing in the regular yeah. season because he made it very clear, Dak did, that he wanted to play a little bit in the regular season so that he could get confident in his other injury, which is the ankle. Look. I love Dak Prescott. I think it's awesome that he got paid. I think he's the face of America's team, the Dallas Cowboys. And I think that the team goes as Dak Prescott goes. That's why I'm concerned. Because he is going into the season, a season, by the way, which is longer now than it has ever been before. 
injured and they don't have a solid backup quarterback situation. And now I think because the Cowboys have leaned so far into there's nothing going on here. There's nothing to worry about. They're not going to make an aggressive move to get a solid backup situation for Dak Prescott, which I absolutely think that they can do. There are a lot of veterans floating out there trying to make third string, fighting for seconds for backup spots who would really serve the Cowboys in this situation, alleviate a little bit of the stress of the rest of the uh, roster. Because if Dak's not out there, let's be honest, this team is not winning. They're not making it to the playoffs mm. without Dak Prescott. This is a concerning situation. I do think he's going to play. But him not being 100% going into this season, a season which is longer now, a, a roster which is based off of Dak Prescott, is very concerning. All right, here's my big guns for you, Rick. And I, I'm so shocked and saddened by Joy's approach to this conversation. I thought we would stay on the same page, but <laughs> she has to get hit with the bullets on this one as well. So here we go. We have been so focused in on the injury, the injuries, plural, of one Dak Prescott. And we make it as though we can't look at a quarterback or a player as being able to have a productive year. Now, anyone will tell you, and, and Joy, you kind of touched on this, anyone will tell you no one's going to really start a season at 100%. No one will be in the season at 100%. No one will finish the season at 100% health. So when you look at it, what defines the greatness of a player during the course of a season? It's the ability to, to handle adverse situations. It's the ability to be able to evolve and, and be able to get through moments where maybe the average person wouldn't be able to do it. A messed up knee, a messed up hand, a jacked up elbow, a messed up shoulder. These are all things that, well, most players, in fact, all of them have to play through. They have to get through. We've made it so convenient to put our scope and our focus on certain people and certain players. He's not going through anything really anybody else isn't going through. I'll prove it to you. Let's go to this full screen. I got a full screen because here comes my big guns, right? Let's call back to business, all right? now You needed about something. It. Oh, well, I'm, I'm giving you something. Uh, Tom Brady, he jacked up his ACL. Coming off of that season, what, what did he do when he came back? Uh, he got a Pro Bowl. Division title. Hmm. Matthew Stafford, who suffered a shoulder injury. What did he do that next season coming off of that horrible shoulder setback? Uh, 5,000 plus yards, a playoff berth. Let's go down to the bottom because there's, there's, I could go through all of these, but let's just skip down to the bottom because I think the bottom is most, most relevant to this conversation. Ian Rappaport reported that Tom Brady played the entire season last year with a torn MCL. He got the procedure done this offseason. He's healing. He's coming into this 2021 season. We don't hear anybody talking about how will Tom Brady play. We're talking about is Tom Brady going to repeat as a Super Bowl quarterback? It's interesting because to me, the weight of a guy, the, 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 the salt in which we measure these guys is based off of how they're able to perform no matter what the circumstances are. That's what athletics is about. That's what competition is about. So to focus on the fact that he has an injury, that's fine. Focus on that. Y'all can come up with a, a, some type of a rebuttal for this, but the reality here is, is that guys play hurt all the time. And the ones that we reverence and love and appreciate and admire are the ones that can still play at a high level, even though the chips may be, the, 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 the deck may be stacked up against them to be able to have success based off of something they're dealing with, a family, a family uh, catastrophe, uh, a health issue, any type of something that builds that admiration. That's what we look for. That's why sports are so amazing, is that it teaches you to be able to deal with situations such as this. Don't write them off. Don't cross off the star, X the star, give the block the square, give it an X, give it a zero, whatever. We're going for tic-tac-toe with Dak Prescott this year. LeVar, the, uh, the full screen that you've got is missing a category. Okay, it's what's missing the category? the category of the injury that all those guys suffered subsequent to that big injury in the following training camp that they had to recover from. 
Where is there wasn't that a, list? But there wasn't because a catastrophic. There wasn't a big injury that took place in training camp. They still had to return from a season-ending or or some type of a season-altering injury that lingered and went into Correct. the offseason. So uh, Dak Prescott doesn't Correct. have a season-ending injury. He had a season-ending injury. That is correct. Okay. And all of these all right. guys had injuries that they had to recover from that were major injuries. But to my knowledge, Tom Brady is practicing right now in training camp. He's and not so being is Dak held Prescott. back by that MC. So is, that, is Dak Prescott. Is that he's, he's practicing. He no, he's like, not. He's he not threw, throwing. He hasn't been throwing he threw, for the first he threw 50 couple balls. of weeks of training camp. He threw 50 balls. In, what? In, he threw 50 balls it's, or so in warm-ups of their last preseason yes. day. It, that is correct. He finally started throwing again. That but we he know was of. limited. Oh, and by the way, he had, a, he had an injury that was separate from the major catastrophic injury that he had. I'm all for guys overcoming stuff. And yes, you are right. It is the mark of great athletes and of competition. But he's already climbing a hill and having to come back from this ankle injury. And to Adam Schefter's point, like, a shoulder or no shoulder issue, he wasn't ever going to be 100% this year. And the Dallas Cowboys have completely lost me on this with this smoke and, smoke and mirrors. I can't believe anything that they say. And honestly, I can't believe anything that Dak Prescott says because even after the shoulder strain, he wanted to be back out there. He was grousing about the fact that they were holding him out. And clearly, if they've held him out as long as they have, there is something that they are legitimately concerned about. And it's not just Dak Prescott that's facing this. If he was the only one that was facing this uphill battle, I'd say, OK. But Ezekiel Elliott hasn't practiced. They're still uh, screwing around with their offensive line. They're not happy with, with the way that's set up. They're still trying to figure out who their center is going to be. Amari Cooper hasn't been 100 percent. So... They've got, it's not just a Dak Prescott issue. It's a number of issues around him. And I'm all for adversity and overcoming it. But look, the Cowboys have had enough adversity. They could use a little bit of a silver lining and they're not seeing it right now. Yeah, I agree that adversity and overcoming adversity is very important. But I have no doubt about Dak Prescott's ability to overcome adversity. His entire life, his entire career has been overcoming adversity. That is not my question here. His, his character is not in question here. It is his body. And to your point, LeVar, about all of those guys that came off of major injuries, I never questioned if Dak Prescott was going to be able to recover from his ankle injury. It's 2021. We have massive advances in modern medicine, despite the fact that nobody wants to believe it. He was going to come off of that ankle injury, but now he has two injuries. There's a reason he's not out there. It's not because Dak doesn't want to be out there. Of course he wants to be out there. It's not because Jerry Jones doesn't believe that he could be out there. Of course Jerry believes he could be out there. It's because the medical staff is not allowing him to be out there. They are important. <laughs> the medical staff is important. They know what's going on. I don't doubt Dak Prescott's grit and ability to overcome adversity. I don't doubt Jerry Jones' faith in Dak Prescott. He paid him. He thinks he's the face of the organization, as does everybody else. But the other thing that you left out in that list of quarterbacks that you mentioned. Here we go. Here is we the go. rest of the team. Tom Brady just won a Super Bowl. And they brought back all the starters. So, yeah, if it, it, they were capable of surrounding Tom Brady with Super Bowl-level players because they just won a Super Bowl. Patrick Mahomes, are we worried Bradford? about Patrick Mahomes' uh, roster? We what? ain't even talking about Pat Mahomes' foot, right? But he, he had to get surgically repaired. He had to get surgery. Does he have repaired. a second injury? But is he, his, but is he compromised roster, right he now? Super Bowl, I can see if the second injury coach. was somewhat. He has, a, he has a Super Bowl roster. So does Tom Brady. So does Tom Brady's so roster. So does Dak Prescott. When did they, when was they in the Super Bowl? Oh, the, so they had to want it to be a Super Bowl roster? So a Super Bowl winning roster is what you're saying? Yes. Okay, that's I'll what take I'm that I would just take a few I players think, who have actually won a Super Bowl and played them. I think the Cowboys roster. have a lot of talents. I think they're capable of getting there if things go right. I think that they should, they are contenders this year, but they haven't done it. So that's just what I think. Do what you want with it. You can't say that about Patrick Mahomes and the Kansas City Chiefs. You can't say that about Tom Brady and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Been there, done that. So it's a different situation on top of the fact that Dak Prescott now has two things he is coming back from to Rick's point. So I don't doubt Dak's ability to overcome adversity. 
I'm saying you come into the season with an actual injury, despite the, what the Cowboys are saying. Mm. Otherwise, he would have been out there. It is a cause for concern, and they need to shore up their backup quarterback situation. So Rick and Joy are saying that when your team's some trash, injuries are worse. I did not say trash. All right, coming up next. I did not say that. I did not say that. <laughs> not say that. <laughs> nah, she did. <laughs> Trey Lance threw two TD passes Sunday. We'll tell you how impressive the rookie's preseason has been next on Speak for Your I'm not saying they're Super Bowl contenders. Trash <laughs> said trash. Rick said trash. All right, it's time for our big story brought to you by Farmers Insurance. Get a quote at Farmers.com. Let's get to the 49ers. Trey Lance, he struggled at the start of his second preseason game Sunday, but he got right later on, finishing with two TD passes and a pick. Lance has thrown for over 200 yards with three touchdowns so far this preseason, which has helped keep the QB chatter alive with Jimmy Garoppolo. So, Rick... Was he impressive? Was Trey Lance's preseason impressive so far? Wildly impressive. Oh, wow. Emphasis wow. on wildly Wait. as much as on impressive. There okay. have been serious highs and there have been serious uh-ohs. But overall, when I look at what he's done, I can't help but be impressed and understand why the 49ers are so geeked up about his potential. Keep in mind, this is a guy who played one game last season at North Dakota State. They really didn't know what they were getting. And I think what impressed me the most uh, in this recent game was the fact that he did struggle early on. One for five, has a pick, and completely unfazed by it. And comes right back, marches them down the field for a TD at the end of the half and has a couple of beautiful throws, is changing plays at the line of scrimmage, takes him down for another TD in the second half. I, it, it's what he is doing completely uh, helps me understand. Not I, Look, I don't know about you guys. I didn't know a whole lot about Trey Lance. There wasn't a whole lot to know about Trey Lance coming out of North Dakota State and having played so little. And what he's shown me is that he has the swagger that they are looking for. And the swagger that quite clearly Kyle Shanahan believes that Jimmy Garoppolo does not have. And are there going to be bumps in the road? No doubt about it. But he has that it factor. He has that level of confidence that you cannot teach in spite of everything else. So I get it. It's going to be, it's going to be a bit of a roller coaster. But man, the highs are going to be higher than anything they've seen in quite some time. Oh, I feel like swagger has been cemented in the sports, like, dialogue, grits, mm. heady mm. swagger. <laughs> he does have mm. swagger, though. He does. He has confidence. I think he's been very impressive, especially when you consider all the things you just mentioned, Rick, which is that he is very raw. Now, do I think he's been impressive enough to take the starting position from Jimmy Garoppolo? No. But what can you ask from any of these young quarterbacks? I think this particular preseason, we've gone really all in with analyzing all of them because, I mean, we're excited for football and there's a lot of young quarterbacks. But we're also not getting as many of the starters in the preseason as we usually get because times have changed and more teams are not putting their starters out there. So you can't really evaluate what they're going up against. But we have what we have to see, and he has looked good. Now, he's had 318 pass attempts in 17 games at North Dakota State. So he's coming in with the fewest college passes thrown by any first-round quarterback in the last 40 years. So we really had no idea what he was. We knew he had the physique. We knew he obviously wowed the Niners in the interviews. And we were waiting to see what he could do on the field against some NFL preseason talent, and he's done a good job. And I think that's all you can ask for from any of these rookie quarterbacks and any of these young quarterbacks. Do they come in and look like they belong? Do they have the swagger, as you mentioned, Rick? Do they look confident? Are they panicking? Are they making mistakes that you just can't even explain, uh, even being a rookie quarterback? And I think that he's done a really impressive job. But I do still think that this is Jimmy Garoppolo's job to lose mm. Shanahan has said he's not saying anything. We'll find out when the season starts, who the starter is. But I think you have to be happy with everything that you're seeing from the development of Trey Lance. Yeah, he's been Im impressive enough, is what I'll say. Impressive enough for the conversation to be what it needs to be, which is a coach that, that took 
what will eventually become the starter of the San Francisco 49ers if all things happen the way that they're supposed to, but will be used in a lot of roles and duties this year. If we look at what Kyle Shanahan's DNA is, when he was in Washington, he had two quarterbacks, RG3, Kirk Cousins. It's kind of the same situation that you have here right now, just in reverse, right? You had the runner, the more athletic guy who was starting in RG3, was a bona fide guy, went number two overall in the draft, and, and played very well. But then you had Kirk Cousins, who was there, played in different situational uh, moments during the course of the game, ended up being the main guy after the injury took place with, with RG3. He is well-versed, speaking of Kyle Shanahan, on being able to handle this type of scenario, and I think that that's why he was so comfortable taking Trey Lance at the pick that he did. We shouldn't be debating how good and how impressive uh, a high draft pick is in the top five of the draft. That should already be understood, that he's talented mm -hmm. and gifted. One thing that has impressed me about Trey Lance is his arm strength. Like, they asked uh, Coach Shanahan about his arm strength, and Coach Shanahan's – Reply was pretty interesting. He said, they need to get used to it. That means they need to get used to it, if you know what I mean. Get used to it. So Trey Lance is on the trajectory probably that, <laughs> that this coaching staff has, has projected him out to be on. He will be on that football field, and he has been impressive enough not to sit there and have somebody saying he's not impressive at all. This could have been a horrible pick. This could have been a bad pick. I think that you're looking at a possible future franchise star in Trey Lance. And I honestly, like you said, I didn't know much about him. I did my homework on him. I was not confident in saying I can see a potential superstar that should have gone that high in the draft going, at, yeah. going into the draft somewhat post-draft, but after seeing him, his arm strength, seeing his composure, his poise, his control of the offense, his understanding of complicated offensive system and scheme that, that Kyle Shanahan has, I am, I'm warming up to the fact that, that Trey Lance was actually the right pick and is the right guy for the 49ers team. It's okay, LeVar. You can be impressed. I'm don't, impressed. Hold, don't hold back. I'm impressed. Don't hold back. Say his name. Okay. Trey Lance. I'm impressed. Come on, I'm, I'm impressed. I, look, I agree with you <laughs> in that normally any high pick, uh, taken as high as he was, that we it, it should be a given that he's going to be great. But the reality is, is that he didn't have that track record. He didn't have that proof. And yet he has been. And, though, and for those who weren't picking up on LeVar's insinuation here from Kyle Shanahan, what Kyle Shanahan is saying is, the Trey Lance's arm is better and stronger than Jimmy Garoppolo's. Mm. That's what they're used to, and this is something different that they're getting. And I, what, what has really impressed me is that I would think that a guy coming from North Dakota State with the limited amount of play that he has had, the most difficult thing, particularly going to the NFL level, would be making the reads, would be getting a grasp of that complicated offense. And yet... The mistakes that he's made has been really a result of his arm overthrowing or throwing too high or hot or whatever. And those are physical mistakes that I would hope that Kyle Shanahan and that coaching staff can fix. So the, the big issue, I think you both would agree with this, is that the biggest question for any college quarterback coming to the pros is not just the physical gifts, but their mental acuity, their More mental so. ability to read and react mm -hmm. in the shorter time span that you're given playing in the pocket in the NFL. And that, to me, is where, uh, where Trey Lance has proved, uh, certainly impressed and proved that he's capable of making that jump in spite of everything that would suggest that it would take longer than it has. You know, one more thing to throw out there in, in all of this is – the better that Trey Lance plays, it's going to put a ton of pressure on Jimmy Garoppolo to play well also. Now, he hasn't played as well as he could or should, but you'd have to assume, as you mentioned, Joy, this is a guy who still is the, the incumbent starter of this team, which makes it very important for him to have success. Why? Because we all know that the backup quarterback is always going to be one of the most important commodities 
that are sought after in the National Football League. At which point in time, if and when Jimmy Garoppolo becomes a backup to Trey Lance, you got to believe that you're looking immediately to what are the trade options, what are the values out there that exist for a Jimmy Garoppolo. So in looking at how impress impressive Trey Lance has been, it also opens up the conversation for can this team, which, by the way, is looking very, very impressive on the defensive side of the ball. Uh, they're playing some really inspired run tackling football and they're playing in coverage. You're getting your offense up to speed where you think that that run for the Super Bowl may not come up short if you're a blamer of the offense. So now you may be able to add a receiver. You may be able to add a draft pick. You may be able to add something of value with the level of, of value that a Jimmy Garoppolo would carry within a trade. So that's something to pay attention to. You would not be able to have that type of conversation if Trey Lance was not showing to be the impressive rookie that he is, Joy. Well, that's why they're in a great situation right now, because J Jimmy talked about wanting to ask for a trade whenever they drafted Trey Lance. And he said he took a couple days and thought about it. And it was the right decision for him, because now he's an, as long as he can stay healthy, which obviously is something you always have to say when you're talking about Jimmy Garoppolo. But as long as he can stay healthy, we know what he's capable of. He was in the Super Bowl with them. Like he, they, you look at their record without him, it shows. He is a winner. Which he a dual quarterback system may help him right. stay he more healthy. Right, he can't stay healthy. Mm. So mm. you can't, that's why Trey Lance is there. It's not because of Jimmy Garoppolo's uh, capabilities. It's because he can't stay on the field. And Kyle Shanahan has said, Trey Lance is going to see the field this year. To your point, he is a different kind of quarterback than Jimmy Garoppolo is. So it's actually a great situation for the Niners, for Trey Lance and Jimmy Garoppolo, which you can't always say about these, <laughs> these quarterback battle situations. Like, they're, they're all in a great situation. Jimmy Garoppolo can prove himself for a future team, which he will be heading to, whether it is in the middle of this season or next year, because they took Trey Lance. Trey Lance is learning behind a guy who has embraced his role, who is a veteran, who's had the experience, he could, and he plays differently, so he's going to have his opportunities while learning from a starter. And Kyle Shanahan knows he has his future from what he's seen from Trey Lance. He's making good decisions. He's stepped up. It's never the, the physical traits that we're worried about with young quarterbacks, as you mentioned, Rick. It's always the mental part. It's faster. There's more to learn. Everything's changing. Audibles, how do they adjust to that? And Kyle Shanahan can sit back and just wait and see how it plays out. Now, to your point, LeVar, they are a contender, which is also a different situation than some of these other quarterback battles that we're seeing around the league. So they do have to play it right. Jimmy G's been a little, little iffy as of late. He might be feeling the pressure a little bit too much. But overall, I think they're in a really good situation. And they've got to be impressed with what they've seen from Trey Lance so far. Coming up, Cam Newton is the Patriots starter for now. But we'll tell you how long that will last next on Speak for Yourself. Cam Newton will not be able to practice in person till Thursday due to a misunderstanding on COVID-19 tests conducted away from NFL facilities. But back on the field, the QB talk between Cam and rookie Mac Jones is still not going away. And offensive coordinator Josh McDaniels was asked, who will be the Patriots week one starter? Take a listen. I know this is going to sound silly, but I mean, I haven't really worried about it. I mean, I think that that decision, you know, from from Bill will 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 be made when the time is right to make it. I mean, Cam certainly is um, is the is the starter now, and he has done a good job. You know, he's gone in there, he played well the other night, um, he's practiced well, and um, but you know, I know those guys are really competing hard, and we're giving them an opportunity to compete and play a lot of football. All right, Joyce. So you heard that from Josh. How long will Cam Newton be the starter in New England? For the record, I hate quarterback competitions. Ugh. Because it's all we talk about. It's so frustrating. I don't understand. If I was a coach, I would just be like, he's the starter. And if I change my mind, I change my mind. Deal with it. But why do they not turn it over to one guy? It makes me insane. Okay. So look, Cam is the starter, right? He is the better player right now than Mac Jones. That doesn't mean that one day Mac won't be better. But Mac is brand new to a very complicated system. Bill Belichick is not the kind of coach that just likes losing for the sake of development. He showed that in all the very aggressive moves 
not traditional Patriots aggressive moves that they made in this offseason to shore up their offense. Cam is in another year in the system. He's had a full offseason now. And I believe he gives them the best chance to win right now in a division where obviously the Bills are going to win the division, we all believe, I think. It's very obvious that they should win it. They're favored to win the division. But they could be a playoff team. So I think Cam will be the starter until he, if he gets injured or he just starts playing so terrible that it starts costing them games. So I don't believe he's going to do that. Obviously, he has had some level of injury history throughout his career, so it is a possibility. But I think that he is the starter, and I, it, I really wish that these teams would just like, name their guy. I think it has value to the locker room. And maybe, LeVar, you can, you can speak on this, but I would want to know who the guy is. It doesn't mean that Mac Jones isn't capable. It doesn't mean that Mac Jones isn't going to become the guy. Otherwise, they wouldn't have drafted him. But I do think there, there is some value in saying, this guy's a starter, and we're not going to keep talking about this through the whole preseason. I think that's more so for the outside world and for the other teams. I think that they try to create a scheming situation where you, you try to play out certain, uh, I guess, advantages for as long as you can. But I'm with you on that one, Joy. And, and listen, this, when I heard this, this topic, I, I, it was so funny because I started thinking about the, the latest round of verses. I don't know if y'all into <laughs> hip hop or like verses or, you know, they've even done gospel on, on verses. But they just did the locks and the dip set, which I'm a major fan of both of them, right? And, and I love the dip set. I was in New York when we fly high. Ballin was out playing for the New York Giants. They did the remix. But in this situation, the dip set is Mac Jones. All right? Or, or, uh, yeah, Mac Jones. And, 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 and then, you know, obviously Cam Newton is, is you know, Jada Kiss in the locks, right? You think about it. They're older. You might not remember all their songs, but they had a whole bunch of hits. And then once you got an opportunity in this versus to hear them, like, side by side, you started to realize that these boys still got it. He still has it. That boy Jadakiss snapped out on verses. And you know what I'm thinking about right now? Everybody's looking at Cam Newton like the locks, like they're old. Weren't they with Biggie? Weren't they with DMX? Like, man, rest in peace. All them cats is resting right now, right? And then they came on stage and started showing up and showing out. Cam Newton gave you glimpses. He still has greatness in him. We saw it in this last game. He was comfortable in the pocket. He stood strong. He delivered the ball. All the people saying, oh, his, his arm is lazy now. It's weak now. He can't deliver the ball. He doesn't throw downfield. Well, you know what? A lot of times, New England doesn't throw downfield. They like throwing crossing routes. They like screens. They like timing routes. This man is the locks, and he's going to win this versus round against the dip set and Mac Jones. And the bottom line is you don't have to not be, you know, putting one down for the other. They're both great, Rick. They're both, both have their both superpowers. But when you look at Cam Newton, he is going to be the starter of this team because he has an it factor that is still it. It has not left yet. Mm -hmm. And so I don't look at this as being a, a short situation where now all of a sudden here comes Mac Jones and he's going to play. I think that Mac Jones might have to get comfortable learning as a rookie under uh, what is perceivably the better performer on the stage. I agree with all that. Uh, it's going to be two games. Uh, oh, Dolphins wow. and Jets. That, and then once we get to what the Saints said, defense said two games. Sheesh. the Bucks defense, <laughs> I, I, I think that they'll, they'll be making a change. I would question that they're both great. I think that they are comparable at this stage of Cam Newton's career. And I do agree with you. He does that. I, I'm, I'm sure that he uh, controls a locker room or his presence in a locker room is far greater than what Mac Jones is at this point. Although the personality that we've seen from Mac Jones it is a bit effervescent. This isn't a shrinking violet from what mm -hmm. we've seen. So there is, there is opportunity there. I, I just, the way that they're approaching this, and I, to your point, Joy, I agree with you that all the subterfuge kind of creating who's going to start and what's the pecking order and all that. But we are talking about the New England Patriots, who, if anybody doesn't tell us what's going on, they are the kings of that, particularly with Bill Belichick. That's what I found the funniest about Josh talking about it. He doesn't even honestly know where they stand. <laughs> I, I mean, I really believe that he's like, 
I don't know. Bill's going to decide that. I, I know that I'm, you know, I run the offense, but uh, I got, I don't have any answers for you. I just, Cam Newton's the starter now as far as, as far as I can tell. And when Bill changes that, then I'll know and I won't tell you, but uh, maybe Bill will. Probably won't either. Uh, that said, I just, I look at the way they've approached the two of them. They are giving Mac Jones a whole cornucopia of options. They are... They're throwing the whole book at him. When I look at this last game, they were pretty conservative with Cam Newton. I mean, he, he has been, he's been called the check down king now by the way they've approached things. They've used max protection to give him the time. They're not complicating things. So I believe like they're putting him in the ultimate sweet spot Tom Brady to be successful thing. enough to start the season as the starter. But I get the same sense with Mac Jones and the Patriots that I get with the 49ers and Trey Lance, which is let's try to throw as much at this, at this guy as we can because we want to get him ready to operate off of the entire playbook as soon as we can. And mm. I'm being a little facetious and being so exact about games, but I just feel like with the Dolphins and the Jets, they can play with a conservative Cam Newton and win. But once you get to the Saints and the Bucks and those top 10 defenses – then you're going to have to be able to do a little bit more. And that's where I could see the cover coming off of the Cam Newton uh, experiment as, as we go here. Oh, wow. But isn't Cam Newton, doesn't he give you more of those options? Yes. I mean, he's a traditional running quarterback. <laughs> yes. He is more physical traits Except than Mac Jones at this point. Like, do you think Mac Jones has a bigger arm than Cam Newton at this point? Because what you're saying, Rick, is that I, the, those two, after those two games – they're going to throw Mac in against Get the em. Buccaneers defense. We saw what they just did against uh, the Kansas City Chiefs in the Get Super em, Bowl. Joy. And then the Saints. Well, I have a lot of questions about the Saints on the offensive side of the <laughs> but ball. No, no, no. They got side. some dogs on the defensive side of the Get ball. Em. So they're going to pull Cam and throw Mac out to the Buccaneers and the Saints. I don't know about that. I don't know about that. I'm, I'm not saying. I don't I'm know about that. Rick. I am not saying by I'm choice. Tripping. I'm not saying by choice. And I'm not saying that they would start him against the Saints or the Bucs. I'm saying it's going to be one of those two games because suddenly they're going to realize that Cam can't do everything that they need him to do to win those kind of games. And because Bill Belichick has invested both so much into this roster overall, as you mentioned, unlike he has done previously and went up and got a Mac Jones in the first round, that it's going to be, you know what, we can't wait. So they're waiting to try to give Mac Jones as much time as possible before they put him in that situation. And so that's why I'm saying they're not going to start from game one, week one, that they're going to try to give him as much time as possible. I'm just saying they're going to get to a point be. where they're going to go, you know what, we need to go to the other option because Cam's not going to be capable get of getting us where we I'm think we should back. go you, with this roster. You get here's what, here's you get where I could see what you're saying no. play out. Go get if him, Cam is terrible in the first two games, against the Dolphins and the Jets. And while I'm just skipping over the Dolphins and the Jets, Dolphins have a great defense. Yes. And while we have a lot of questions about the Jets, their defensive line is not bad either. So if he's terrible okay. against the Dolphins and the Jets, who, by the way, are in division, then yes, I do think that they will say, Mac, good luck with the Bucks and the Saints. But we've had enough because we just lost two division games, which I don't think will happen. I, will, I do think that they will lose to the Dolphins and that they will beat the Jets. But depending on how Cam plays in those games, if he costs them a game, then I could see that happening. But I don't think that that's what's going to happen. I think Cam is going to be the starter until it is so obvious that Cam is holding the team back, which I don't believe will happen. But if it does, then they will put Mac out there, even if he is not necessarily better than Cam at this point. It's just because it, it, it's obvious that they will need to change, and you're going to lose the locker room if you're going to keep Cam out there when there is another option in Mac Jones. Or, of course, if he's injured, which in which case there's nothing even to discuss here. But Cam gives you an extra element to your offense because he is a running quarterback. He is more physically capable than Mac Jones at this point. What it comes down to for me with the Patriots is because this is such a complicated offense because Bill Belichick does have the standard of Bill Belichick and the Patriots. It's who's going to make the least amount of mistakes. We know that that's how the Patriots operate. They aren't going to go out here and do a bunch of crazy stuff. They're not going to take unnecessary chances with things that they don't feel like is going to work. Bill Belichick wants to win games. He doesn't want to be embarrassed. And nobody else in that Patriots roster does, for that matter, either. And their fans don't either. They have standards in, with the Patriots, as they should. 
So even though Tom Brady isn't there anymore, it doesn't mean like everyone forgot. We're used to winning. So I don't think they're going to, it's not, I don't think you can compare the Patriots quarterback battle to these other ones that we have okay. around the league. Jimmy Garoppolo is capable of getting to a Super Bowl and was maybe one throw away from winning a Super Bowl. His question is health. Otherwise, Trey Lance wouldn't be there. We know what Jimmy Garoppolo okay. is capable of. Andy Dalton and Justin Fields, another different situation. Those coaches that GM aren't comfortable. They have to win games now. So they, they're going to have someone that's going to help them win right now, even though Justin Fields is obviously the future. Urban Meyer who's talking about there's a quarterback battle there. But we know Trevor Lawrence is, and they have a long runway in Jacksonville. The Eagles, who knows what's going on there. But there, I don't think you can compare all these quarterback situations to what's happening with the Patriots. The Patriots can be a playoff team. No, you can't. Belichick has standards, and if Cam Newton is capable, he gives you a more dynamic offense because of his running capability, and he will be the starter out there. Mm. But to your point, Joy, like the, all the versatility that Cam Newton has – uh, Bill Belichick wants to play this conservative with his quarterback. So you're not going to use the full array of what Cam Newton is capable of doing oh, or that he's demonstrated oh, in the past. On, it's going to be, can you execute what I need you to do in this particular situation? And there's a plenty of history on Cam Newton in New England that raises the question as to whether he's capable of that. And you guys just talked about it. Like, let's not make too much of the preseason. Well, let's not make too much of the preseason. And that goes to what Cam Newton has done in this preseason with full protection and completing a few check down passes. I just I don't I can't go overboard in that direction and say Cam Newton, without question, is going to be the quarterback going forward. It's not the same as these other quarterback competitions because this one actually is kind of wide open. There is a legitimate question as to who is going to be the starting quarterback week one. I believe it's going to be Cam Newton. I don't believe that they want to go to Mac Jones right off the bat. But there's a better chance, far better chance of Jimmy Garoppolo being the week one starter for the 49ers than there is... Uh, of Cam Newton I won't being the week one starter. I won't disagree with that, Rick, but I will say this. If Mac Jones is not your week one starter and gets an opportunity to get his feet under him in week one and two or even three, you do not put Cam Newton in the games one, two, and three and then decide all of a sudden, yeah, we're going to switch up week four, uh, week four being against uh, Tampa Bay. Let me tell you something. If you got Batman and Robin, which Batman is Mr. Cam Newton and Robin is Mac Jones right now, you do not send that man out on the field for his first encounter with Superman. You don't do it. You're going to have to sit there and you're going to have to deal with the fact that Cam is going to have to go head to head with Tom Brady coming into Foxborough. If he does not start the season, you're not going to make that, that change. You would never put that type. <laughs> Boy, wonder you would feel, never put that type really of pressure. That. You would never put that type of pressure on your saying, own child. I'm not saying Why you would, you would plan on, on doing that. That's I'm so not right. saying you would plan on you're not doing that. Do that. They're not gonna I'm put saying mac and out there they that. may be no. forced to do that. <laughs> if you don't. If you ain't gonna be ever forced to do that. And, and, and speak, you ain't ever gonna be That's forced to do really that. That's a really good point, Lamar. <laughs> Coming up next, one of LeBron's former teammates called the Lakers old. Well, we'll tell you if they're still title contenders in this Lakers team next on Speak for Yourself. Boy Wonder versus Super. Let's get to the NBA. The Lakers had a complete overhaul of their roster, but the changes have also brought out the critics since the new moves, including Russell, Res Russell Westbrook and Carmelo Anthony, have helped give LA the oldest roster in the league. One of LeBron's former teammates, Channing Frye, called them out saying, quote, I love Ron. I love AD. I like Melo. I like Russell Westbrook. It's 2021. There's not enough balls to go around. In the playoffs, it's a big what if this old ass team has to make its 82 games to the playoffs. So, Rick, are the old Lakers title contenders? No, they are not title contenders. If everything that we've seen when it comes to the Lakers and it comes to winning championships and what they had, what their hallmark was last year, uh, is their offense going to be improved? Yeah, probably. Russ Westbrook coming in and Carmelo Anthony is going to upgrade their ability to score the ball. And I do believe in regular in the regular season, 
that they will be formidable. That's going to be a tough group to prepare for on a night in and night out basis. But they also lost an awful lot and they lost the hallmark of their team last year. Last year's offense wasn't very good. 24th in the league last I checked. But their defense was number one and it was number one even when Anthony Davis was not playing or was healthy. Uh, same with LeBron James missing time. That was because of Contavious Caldwell Pope, Alex Caruso, and Dennis Schroeder, all of whom received at least one vote for the all-defensive teams for the year. How many votes did Russ Westbrook, Carmelo Anthony, and Kent Bazemore receive for all-defense last year? Not a single vote. And I would dare say that it's probably been a couple of years before, uh, since any one of them has received a vote. That's where things go sideways uh, with this team. Uh, the age and the experience and the offensive firepower and the depth that they've tried to create, I could see them being formidable during the regular season. I'm even going to give you the benefit of the doubt and say they can get through the 82 games. But if we're talking about title contenders and we look at how this year's title was won, yes, three-point shooting was a big factor during the regular season. And it was early on in the playoffs. But ultimately, when we got down to the last couple of rounds, it was about how well you could defend. And that is where the Lakers are coming up short, nowhere close to what they were last year. And that's why as much as I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing this experiment, I can't, I, just, I can't put them in the title contender category, even though the Western Conference, in my opinion, is wide open. Well, as long as LeBron is on the Lakers, I'm going to say that they are contenders. I know he keeps saying it's washed king and everyone's doubting him, and I'm not buying into that. I don't think that LeBron is washed. Now, I, I'll, well, I agree with you, Rick. The defensive part of it is a factor, and in the playoffs, in the late in the playoffs, we did see how valuable defense was. But I would also argue that health played a much bigger role in those two teams being in the finals. We saw what they went up against throughout the playoffs, and had everyone been healthy, would those two teams be there? We don't know. Obviously, it played out how it did, and you know we have our champion. But I do think that health is a big factor, which is why I believe Russell Westbrook is huge for the Lakers, because we know he's going to be at ludicrous speed every single game. He's going to bring it 100% during the regular season, and I do think that's something that the Lakers need, especially because they are the oldest team in the league. But... I'm laying all this at the feet of Anthony Davis. If they're going to win a championship, if they're truly going to be contenders, it's on Anthony Davis. He's the fourth youngest player on this team at 28. He's the guy. Are you if comfortable Anthony doing that? Um, no, <laughs> but that's what it is. Okay. Like, this is what they have assembled. So if they are going to be contenders, if I'm going to assume that Anthony Davis is going to be healthy at the end of the season, which is obviously a big assumption, then they, will, they have a chance to win a championship because Anthony Davis is healthy. He is a, an incredible player. We saw what he's capable of when he's healthy. When he's healthy. So it's not, to me, it's not really about the rest of the roster. It's not about the defense. It's not about if LeBron is going to be what he's capable of at this point in his career. It's not about Russell Westbrook. It's about Anthony Davis to me. If he's healthy, they're going to be a problem. It's just a matter of his health. Okay. But I've seen him one time where he was healthy enough to help a team win a championship one time. And that was in a truncated season where he had three months off before on, we had Rick. this short no, runway fair. to it's win the title. It's fair. Come on. That's, I mean, so how, how long I, has I he been, how long has he been with the that. Lakers? At that point in time, how long had he care. been with the Lakers? How long has he been in the league? How long had and he been with the Lakers? Won one round, one playoff round prior to getting to the Lakers, how and then they long? go to the bubble and they win a championship. How long was he with the Lakers? Some would say, the that going into the bubble was more harsh conditions than being in a regular season. But not physically, LeVar. No, not physically. I mean, he had he had months off and he came in 100 percent healthy and it was a shortened season. It's it's fair from Rick. It is. This is why, um, this is why it's my question. Is he going to get through an entire it's season? It's fair from me. I'm healthy. always fair. <laughs> I'm not buying that. I'm not buying that. I think the, the, the situation is the situation. And we can look at it in terms of rest. We just talked about the whole Dak Prescott situation and how he's washed up and all that stuff, and no, he doesn't have anything left. No one I'm going to double down on this with LeBron James. You know, it's called the bathers. You know, you, you kings get washed. I mean, he's not washed up. He's washed. He's been clean for quite some time now. Listen, they were 
the guys that were in the league to be looked at as winning the championship this year. Are we going to debate that? Are we going to debate that? Were we not looking at them to come out of the West and be able to contend for the championship as a contender this season? I think and, and beginning say, of the year, yes. And to say that beginning and, of the year, yes. Okay, but and, then we got to the end of the year, and Anthony even Davis was hurt again. Mid-season, and LeBron James towards the end, got hurt again. All right, so here's here's the problem that I have with this. You say that they lost a lot, and that that takes away from the team that they are. What did they really lose? That's considered to be a lot on this Lakers team, on this Lakers roster. Are we going to throw Schroeder the out best there? Three. He didn't play very yes. much. He was injured quite a bit as well. He didn't make as much of a difference as they would have liked him to make. Are we going to look at our guy that just went to, to the 76ers? He didn't even play in the, in, in, uh, in the, in the last part, in the last rounds of, of the playoffs. He's on the sideline, joking around, playing around, imitating what LeBron James is doing, right? So to me, when I look at you, all right, P Caldwell Pope is your biggest loss on this roster. If you're telling me by adding Russell Westbrook in the immediate, forget talking about Melo and what he can bring to you in, in, in uh, the sharpshooting game and, and spot situations or even Ariza who can help you on the defensive side of the ball who plays some very fierce defense or even Dwight Howard that could possibly give you some good boards and some defensive uh, moments at the cup. For me... I look at this team and I say, as long as, and Joy touched on this, as long as you have LeBron on your roster for now, I'm not going to cut against that. And then you add AD to that. You're talking about a guy in Russell Westbrook, who I will continue to maintain, will be the energy of this team in the regular season. They needed a mm. guy who would buy them time during the regular season so that they can mm. focus their attention in the postseason. Russ is mm. going to give you what you need during this regular season with a cast crew. They're going to get to the playoffs. They're going to come to life. And there's not going to be a team that can stand up to them until they get to the finals, which will be probably the Brooklyn Nets, which I think they match up very well against if they were to play them in a seven-game series. They have to be considered a, a contender. Okay, so I'm not basing this just on, you know, airy things that I just believe, fantasies or whatever. I'm basing oh, this on we what go. we've seen. Okay. Russell Westbrook, I'm glad, I'm so glad, LeVar, that you kept emphasizing in the regular season. Yes. Because That's what we in know. the regular season, yes, Russell Westbrook is a force to be reckoned with. No question about it. And they needed that energy and they needed that drive. It was something that was missing. No question. But Russell Westbrook falls off in the postseason. And he falls off dramatically when it comes to efficiency. And he did that in spite of having a great regular season with the Washington Wizards last year. And the reason that they couldn't get out of the first round and weren't even a threat to get out of the first round is because Russell Westbrook was a completely different player in the postseason. That playing with your hair on fire and high reward, high risk style does not work in the postseason. And that's what Russell Westbrook is. So you add that You don't that find with the, the leadership of LeBron that, James to be a catalyst in that I'm being a difference? I'm so glad you took me to my next okay. point because okay. here's the thing. <laughs> there you go. I had the opportunity to see LeBron James against the Phoenix Suns when Anthony Davis went down. And it was the great opportunity for the washed king, not to demonstrate to me on Instagram with emojis or on Twitter that he's, he's uh, incensed by being called the washed king. Show me. Anthony Davis isn't there. Show me that you can still give me one of those magnificent LeBron James type games with everything on the line. The man couldn't score 30 points or more in three opportunities. Couldn't give me that demonstrative magnificent over-the-top performance to win a single game against the Phoenix Suns, who were brand new to the playoffs, had not been there in 10 years. If there was ever an opportunity for LeBron James to take advantage of all his experience in the postseason, it was right there on a platter. And I don't believe it's because he didn't want to. I believe that he no longer can give you that kind of performance, oh, which is gosh. not an insult oh. to someone who's about to turn 37 years old. It's just the reality of it. So 
I get why you guys have such confidence in LeBron James. As long as he's there, there's always a chance. And for most of the time of his career, I would have agreed a thousand percent with you. But at this point, the LeBron James that I'm seeing, when he hits that starter, that ignition, it is not roaring the way that it once did. And that's why I don't believe that he's enough. It's why, to your point, you need an Anthony Davis to be all that Anthony Davis can be in order for them to win. I can't count on Anthony Davis being there. And if he's not there, I can't count on LeBron James being what he once was. Yeah, no, Anthony Davis is the factor here for me, 100%. It's not LeBron. If Anthony Davis is healthy with LeBron, they are going to be a problem no matter who they are up against. But one hill I am not going to die on is that LeBron James is washed. I'm just not willing to do it. I'm not predicting when Tom Brady's going to retire, and I'm not calling the end of LeBron's <laughs> skills either. Not going to be me. Coming up, Dak Prescott has not played all preseason. We'll tell you if that was the right move by the Cowboys. Next on Speak for Yourself. You wrong, Greg. You did wrong. Let's get back to Dallas. The Cowboys face the Bucks in the season opener. And Jerry Jones said over the weekend, if that game was last Saturday, Dak Prescott would be starting and they would feel great about it. Dak has not played a snap all preseason. And according to Adam Schefter, he will not be 100% from his injuries all year. We're now joined by NFL analyst TJ Hushmanzada. So I have to ask you, TJ, uh, is this the right move for the Cowboys to sit Dak the entire preseason? There we go. Absolutely, it's the right move. This is where the NFL is going. Guys don't play in the preseason. LeVar is holding it. LeVar, if we play today, you absolutely would not want to play in the preseason. I didn't want to play when I was playing, but we did. If you look at, at the Cowboys all? record, look at the Cowboys record without Dak. They can't afford any slip ups. They're four and seven without Dak winning 61 percent of their games with Dak. You don't play Dak. You don't risk it. Dak Prescott, you think he forgot how to play quarterback? You don't know how to read the defense. He doesn't know where to go with the ball. He knows what he's doing. He can play the quarterback position without playing in the preseason. This is new age football, LeVar. Guys don't need to play in the preseason. Sean McVay started it, and everybody's following suit. They made the correct decision by not letting Dak play in the preseason. Why would you? I would love to go last because, honestly, I know everybody on this panel is going to say, oh, it's a great decision not to play him. It's a new age NFL. You don't need to play him. Sean McVay did it. They're this and they're that. Ben DiNucci, 0-1 as a starter. Garrett That's Gilbert. That's why you don't play him. Oh, and one is a starter. That's Cooper why you don't Rush, play him. Zero and zero <laughs> as a starter. 43, 44, three. That's their passing attempts um, between the three of them. See, I could see the argument as to being careful and overly careful and cautious to not play Dak Prescott because those are the reasons why, because you don't have a backup. It's 100% the reason why you have to take a chance and take the bubble wrap off of him and put him out there and see how his leg reacts, how his arm reacts to being out there in a real rep. I don't care if it's one, one series. I don't care if it's one series. Heck, I don't care if it's a set of downs and you take him out before that series is even over. But to tell me you're going to keep him laced up in bubble wrap until you get to the regular season because he knows how to read a defense. Sure, he does. He knows how to throw the ball. Sure, he does. He knows how to play football. Sure, he does. But the question I have is how is he going to react? He doesn't even know how his body is going to react under duress from a pass rush, getting hit, or whatever it may be once he gets into a regular season game. What if he gets into that regular season game and you don't realize that he is ready to go? You're going to Ben DiNucci? Are we going to go to Garrett Gilbert? Are we going to go to Cooper Rush? Cooper Rush probably won't even be on the roster. So you're telling you me it's okay to sit there and wait for the simple fact that we're going to play it safe to make sure that our $30 million plus a year man is just fine and ready to go when you can't even really predict that he's just fine and ready to go. 
Well, if he was just coming off an ankle injury, I might agree with you to some degree, but he's not. He's coming off an ankle injury, surgery, missing the season, and now his shoulder is clearly injured as well. So, yes, they did the right thing. He doesn't need to go out there and strain anything just to test out and see how he feels in a game. He knows what it is. Dak Prescott is capable of going out there week one and playing football. Now, if he gets injured during the regular season, that's a different conversation. But if you force him out there, if you or if you allow him to go out there because he clearly wants to go out there while he's recovering from, recovering from that ankle surgery and now his shoulder has a strain, and he gets injured and is out for the season, then what? So y'all what, saying what, it's what going, did you prove? So y'all so y'all saying it's gonna all be better by the time we get the regular season. It's not worth the reward. So he's not a rookie. So let's hold he him out till next season. He just signed his his long term contract. What is the value? The value has to be you worth said, it for him to go. Let's 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 let's, like, let's, uh, let's Kawhi season. Leonard him. Let's let's hold him out for the entire season. Let's hold him out for regular season. These games don't count. Let's make sure he's okay. These games don't count. These games don't make count. It, sense, right. it doesn't make any sense. When does games the regular count. season start? When they count. When does the Tampa, Bay Buccaneers. The Tampa Bay Buccaneers? The Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Yes. How many weeks away is that game? One, three weeks. Three. Right. How many? Does it matter? You guys, you, it does matter. You guys have gotten lost in the sauce. It does and matter. Lamar, you don't have to play the victim. It's not three against one. Not everybody's against you. Oh, and okay. Not everybody disagrees with you. No, okay. I disagree. If, this is if, a setup. Here's a if setup. he didn't have a strained muscle in his shoulder, mm -hmm. I would say yes, it would be worthwhile that he got at least a couple of snaps out there just to get comfortable, just to feel what it's like to be in a semi-game-like situation on that ankle. But it's absolutely true that they made the right move because that's not where he is. He can't help himself right now. He came out on day one and was so geeked up about being out there and proving that I'm worth this contract and I can lead us where everybody wants me to lead us. And he strains his shoulder doing it because he overthrew. And, and I don't know what's going on with the Cowboys medical staff and that Mike McCarthy looks at the numbers. They literally have biometrics that they can gauge how much uh, effort and how much stress a guy's putting on his various body parts. And they had parameters and they overshot those and what they allowed Dak to do day one. And as a result, he's now throwing. And TJ, you're, it's one thing to say he doesn't need preseason games, but he certainly needs preseason practice. And he hasn't been able to get any of that. So that is the issue here. They're, it's absolutely true that they made the right move because they had to make this move. They do need him 100% for week one, game one, because as we found out as a result of Dak being out, they don't have a backup quarterback right now. So in a way, it also <laughs> oh benefits <my> <laughs> them in having Dak out because they found out we need to go back. <laughs> we need to go back out of the market and see if we can find somebody Correct. who can actually back up. Our Man, guy. They knew so before, ultimately, they, knew correct. they started, made they the right move. Backup. Correct. Figure that out. They do need to I'm go sorry, out in the market Rick. and get another backup. I agree with you. And I also agree with you, Rick, and I guess in some ways with LeVar, mm -hmm. that if he wasn't dealing with this shoulder strain, then a series, you know, a little bit of time out there just so he can feel comfortable because he said he wanted to get some game reps in preseason so that he could trust his ankle again. Well, that's taken away from you when you also have a shoulder strain. Now you are the franchise. The franchise goes as you go. So even if you want to be out there, which I'm sure Dak Prescott does, and I'm sure Mike McCarthy wants to get him out there and Jerry Jones, the medical staff is saying no, and you have to listen to them because that's what they do. That's why they went to school. That's why they're doctors. That's why they're there. That's what they get paid to do is protect everyone from themselves because everyone always wants to play. Everyone always wants to go out there. And we know what Dak is capable of, but you have to protect him from himself. If he was just coming off the ankle injury, oh. I'm okay with them not playing playing him at all in the preseason, and I'm okay with them playing him a series or two just so he can feel comfortable for his, his mental uh, recovery from the injury. You're but in this Pittsburgh, situation, Joy. they did the right thing. You're from Pittsburgh, Joy. I, I, I expect that softness out of a West Coast dude. Oh, please. TJ's soft. Listen, the game. You don't need to practice. I expect that out of TJ. I do not out. expect that from play. a Western PA raised person. Practice. Come on, Three man. Weeks. You cannot make, first of all, we cannot make this conversation solely about Dak Prescott. Dak Prescott needs to prove to that staff, medical 
and coaching staff and players that they can trust him going into the season. At oh, least it, give me what? one series. What? Prove it. Why is that? Prove why it. is it? Why? They, he why? proved it when he's not in the game. They can't win games. You don't take that chance. But you don't know Why what he's going. You? you don't know what he is going to be. He doesn't know what he's going I to do be. Know what he's the going medical to be. staff does really not know what he's he going plays, to be. I know he sucks. I know the team sucks when he does it. I know that. If if Lamar, my team is not going to be any practice. good, you're, but you're making my point. If this team is not going to be any good without Dak Prescott then why would you not figure out if he can go out there at least for a series and show he can play he can. so that I know I can and I know if I need to get another guy in here because these, these guys on my roster currently are not the answer for these what we're trying to do if he goes out. Anybody that I bring in, they're not the answer either. It might be. It might be a they're trade for Garoppolo. It might be a trade for Minshew. It might be a trade for one of these guys that they have. And on that's the trading gonna, and that's block. That's going to give you a good season. And that's going to give you a good season. You don't know, Absolutely but it's a better not. season than what they have. And, and at least I know. Because if Dak Prescott, if what you guys are saying, we're going to wait to get to the season where it matters and where it counts to find out if Dak can do it. Not if Dak is going to play well. We're going to get to the season to see if Dak can do it with no opportunity of being able, no recourse to be able to get somebody in and up to speed. You talk about two, two three weeks before they start to play, why would you not want to figure out if this man can get out there and play and then pull him and know if I need to try to figure out if I need to get somebody in here that can get up to speed on the offense? No, you, you don't want somebody to get in there that can learn the offensive if scheme you well bring enough somebody and you're in, punting it's on the already season. Over. It's a it's bad decision. Over. You're punting on the season. Speaking of what could be a punting on the season if he's no good. Coming up, I'm so upset right now. Zach Wilson. He's showing us why he was the number two overall pick in the draft. But we'll tell you how excited Jets fans should be. Well, I'll tell y'all because it seems like they don't want to tell y'all anything. <laughs> Next, come on, speak for yourself. <laughs> Let's head to the Big Apple, where rookie Zach Wilson is giving the Jets hope as their franchise quarterback. Wilson was nearly perfect in Saturday's preseason win, finishing with two touchdown passes and over 100 yards. The New York Post even wrote, quote, it's okay for Jets fans to get excited about Zach Wilson. DJ Harris Manchada is back with us, and he actually worked with Wilson before the draft. But we'll start with LeVar. How excited should Jets fans be about Wilson? They should be excited. I mean, a fan is a fan, so they're going to be blindly led by emotions and, and mental feelings and fantasies of what Zach Wilson can be. I mean, be excited until you're not. I mean, let's think about it. Let's go back to the last times they uh, had two number, well, top five overall draft picks, all right? Think about it. Mark Sa Sanchez in 2009, all right? Take a look at that. Huh. Uh, yeah, rookie of the year? No. All pro? Mm, no. Pro bowler? Mm, AFC champ? No. Mm, all right. Sam Darnold? Same category. Statistical categories, you would say, of awards. Those are your two guys that came in as uh, highly rated, highly, highly touted, uh, respected out of college guys that, well, you felt were going to be franchise changers. They didn't change the franchise much that I could tell. Now, they did get two divisional deals with Sanchez, but it wasn't because of Sanchez. It was because of some hardcore running and some hardcore defense that was being played in New York. So be excited about Zach Wilson. I don't know that he's a better quarterback coming out of college than what we saw in Sam Darnold and, and, and Darnold and Mark Sanchez. Mark Sanchez was like football Jesus coming out. Um, there's guys like Sam Bradford, football Jesus is coming out of, of college. Mark Sanchez is in that category of guys that we looked at – could have been can't miss considered um, back then, and they missed. And they missed because they went to New York and played for the Jets where they just can't figure out how to get it all the way right. It's a can't-get-right organization right now, and it's very difficult to put the onus on one person to be able to go in there and turn around all of the misfortunes, all of the mishaps, all of the bad decisions, culturally speaking, success speaking, all of those different things that exist 
I just don't see the shoulders being that strong on on Zach. But I will say this: be excited until you're not, because I mean, as of right now, he still could be the guy that makes a difference for your team. I say, like sure should be excited. Right he was the number two pick of the draft. He's going into this with more weapons as a rookie than Sam Darnold had pretty much the entirety of his time with the New York Jets. The thing that concerns me is this. A slotted system, and Zach Wilson gets into camp late. Like, he was out here in Southern California throwing while the rest of his teammates were in training camp. That concerns me. They're at the top. It's just dysfunctional. I like Salah as the head coach. I believe defensively he's going to keep them in games. Elijah Moore, Corey Davis as his receivers, that's going to help him. But we need to temper expectations. He is playing well in the preseason, but he is playing against non-starters, LeVar, because nobody wants Dak Prescott or their starters to play in the preseason. So we want to get our number two guy hurt. That's all. Uh, yep, I got you. They're going against non-starters. Let's him get hit. You have to be excited. The Zach Wilson, he was born to be a quarterback. He was born to throw the ball. If Salah can get that defense rolling, it's going to take some time. But I believe the Jets will get over the hump because offensively, he has better weapons than Sam Darnold ever had. Hmm. Yeah, the Jets fans should be excited, but they should also be reasonable. I agree with you, TJ. It's just, just be a little patient here with Zach Wilson. I, I think of Zach, Zach Wilson is probably in the most unique situation of all of these rookie quarterbacks as far as what he's going into. Now, look, they could have just asked me about Adam Gase and I would have saved them some trouble. So I do think they are in a better situation with Robert Sala, and he's never coached a regular season game in the NFL. But he has brought in his system. He is a very well-respected man, and he's going to try and establish a culture there. Up top, we know what it is. You just mentioned. It's very dysfunctional. That's why they've been a failure year after year after year. And this division is nothing to play with. Miami is no longer in a rebuild. We know what Bill Belichick and the Patriots do to rookie quarterbacks, no matter who he's got at the, at the quarterback position. They win. And the Bills are serious. They are Super Bowl contenders. So this is a really rough situation for the Jets and for Robert Sala and Zach Wilson going into the regular season. Just made but, sense. but... You gotta like what you've seen from Zach Wilson in the preseason. I don't overreact to the preseason, or at least I try to not overreact to the preseason. What I want to see from young rookie quarterbacks is poise. I want to see confidence. I don't want to see them making mistakes that you just can't even explain. Them being panicky, bailing out on the pocket when it's really not necessary. And he's done a really good job in the preseason. So just keep your expectations based off of what we're actually watching and be patient with the Jets overall. It's not like Tua where he's going into a situation where you've got a great coach and you've got whole sides of the ball figured out. It's not like Josh Allen where you have a great coach and a great coordinator and they're putting all these incredible pieces around him. This is a rebuild from the bottom to the bricks we were built. We, we took out the building Beyond and the everything bricks. underneath it. All Go right, the so dirt. they are starting, exactly. They are starting over and Jets fans should definitely be excited about it. They deserve to be excited about it. They should back him all the way. But just, you know, keep How many it, keep years it in does a rebuild take? How many years does a rebuild take? Well, nobody has a lot of time that's, in the NFL anymore and that's the as problem. far as rebuilds go. <laughs> that's I, the like problem. the Dolphins didn't and the Jets won't. And it does matter where you are. I do think the market matters. Bills fans, a little more patient than Jets and Dolphins fans and Patriots fans. Where you are, who your see coaches progress. are, you, you need to see progress more quickly, and that, that does you matter. You said two years, TJ. Go ahead, Rick. LeVar, LeVar, what? Go what? Ahead. Why are you raining on the Jets fans' parade? Like, what's the deal here? I'm just looking at the they facts. They have something to be excited about. Yes. And you're like, yeah, you know what? Go ahead. You can get excited until you're been not going to be excited. Before. As if you are almost predicting that Zach Wilson is going to fail. And I even understand why you may predict that, because I look at the Jets quarterback history, and it's the safe way to go. Yes, Zach Wilson's not going to work out like any other quarterback, except... And I'm not going to make a big deal about the preseason. I'm not going to have you guys take my argument on Mac Jones and flip it on its head like you did <laughs> that previous segment. I'm not making too much of preseason. But I will say this. From what we have seen, all things being equal, I feel better about what I've seen from Zach Wilson than I ever saw from Sam Darnold or Geno Smith. And so I look at it and say, yeah, there's reason to be excited. There is 
There is the hint that they might have, after all this time, finally found their quarterback, a guy who's capable of playing the position on a good team. Now, here's the problem, and this is where things have to be tempered, not when it comes to Zach Wilson, but when it comes to the New York Jets as a whole because they are very much in the rebuilding process. So Zach Wilson may be that guy. They may have found their quarterback, but we're not going to know that until they put a team around him. I look at it very much like the Bengals and Joe Burrow, and not to oh, say that I'm Zach so Wilson is Joe that. Burrow. I'm not saying that. I'm I am so not glad. saying that. I'm so glad you What said I'm that. saying is everybody got excited about Joe Burrow knowing that the mm. Bengals were still not going to be oh, good in, no matter what Joe Burrow did. I feel the same way with Zach Wilson. Like, Let's give him a chance. But what we've seen initially, it's like, you know what? They might have found something. I never felt that way with Sam Darnold. Um, I never felt that way with Geno Smith. We'll see with Zach Wilson. But the bottom line is, you're a Jets fan. What else do you have to get excited about? LeVar, let them have their piece of cake, at least for the time being, and not go, yeah, you know what? Yeah, it's a good piece of cake. You know, but it's a lot of calories. You're probably uh, going to get cholesterol. Hey, hey, it's going to hurt your health. Hey, like, what, what, like, why do you have to bring up all the other stuff? Just say, you know what? Zach Wilson looks really good. You guys should be excited. Uh, TJ, and leave it there. TJ, I got, I got one question I want to ask you. Did you I'm play for a dysfunctional hurt. organization in Cincinnati with a ton of talent yes. on your team? Dysfunctional? Yes. With a ton of talent? Yes. yes. Now, Joy just said, a dysfunctional organization. Did you just say that, Joy? A dysfunctional organization in the New York Jets. Yeah. Up, top. That, up, up top. Up top. Up top. Was it was it dysfunctional up top in Cincinnati, TJ? Yes. Yes. Because it was a it was dysfunctional up top in, in Washington as well. How many Super Bowls appearances? <laughs> how how well did oh y'all do? How well Here did y'all we accomplish go. in Cincinnati with that dysfunction? What's yeah, your point, LeVar? And, and you know, LeVar, zero, what's your hey, point? Hey, hey, let's match those zeros up on, on national television up on game, TJ. Let, let me tell you this. The point hey, eventually is... Eventually, things have to change somewhere. They you gotta, will the never... The change has to start somewhere. Ever, ever, never, ever, ever, ever come around here again and win with dysfunction <laughs> starting at the top. I'll well, call it a day. Coming up... I'll call it a day. Will Baker Mayfield take a huge jump this season? We'll answer that next on Speak for Yourself. Never, ever, 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 ever. Baker Mayfield helped the Browns win their first playoff game since 1994. Last season he did that. Now, on to the next. And it's year two for the QB and being in Kevin Stefanski's system. Baker said earlier in training camp, I'm truly hoping to make a huge jump taking care of the ball and being efficient. So, Rick, do you expect Baker Mayfield to take a huge jump this season? No, I do not expect Ooh. him to make a or take a Ooh. huge jump. I expect the Cleveland Browns collectively to make a jump uh, with 11 offensive starters back. And I do believe that Baker Mayfield is going to be maybe more consistent than he was last year. But they know who Baker Mayfield is. Is he going to be good? Yes, I would expect that he's going to be good. But they now know that he's not a quarterback that is going to carry them anywhere. I like the way you put it when you introduced this subject. You said he helped them win their first playoff game. That is correct. I would say that the Pittsburgh Steelers really helped them a True. lot too. But we'll put that aside. <laughs> Uh, they know who Baker Mayfield is, so they're not going to ask him to do too much, nor do they have to because they have built a team around him that allows him to be who he is. He can be a good quarterback. He's not a great one. So while I see them collectively making a jump, I, we're not going to be blown away by Baker Mayfield's numbers because they're not going to ask him to do things that are going to produce monstrous numbers or anything significantly bigger than he did last year. Uh, again, I believe he's part of the train. He can be part of their success, but making some huge jump as if he's going to prove that he is the quarterback that we thought he might be when he first came into the league. We know too much about Baker Mayfield at this point. He can be good. He's not going to be great. Wow. I disagree, and that's painful for me to say as a Pittsburgh girl, and your Cincinnati guys might mm. be a, 
a little bit of bias there too, but I like what the I, don't, no, I, don't I like what so. the Browns are so. building. And what it really comes down to I do too. for Baker Mayfield is that uh, contract situation that he is playing for. Little contract, this, uh, little contract, mm -hmm. little contract little, situation. Little bit of money. Josh Allen, um, forty-three million a year average annually. He would like a piece of that as well. He's not getting so, that. Well, look, I don't think he's going to get a Josh Allen contract. No. But they are going to have to pay him, and this is the year that he needs to prove that he deserves to be paid and is the franchise quarterback. And I don't see why he can't do that. They're an improved. It's his second year in Stefanski's system. system. Stefanski is coach of the year. I think they're going to be better this year, and I think Baker will be better as well. He is now in a comfortable situation. For all the crap that Baker Mayfield gets, let's not forget the situation he came into. We're talking about Zach Wilson and the Jets and that being dysfunctional. Baker Mayfield had four head coaches in his first three years in the league. That ain't easy. Who can overcome that? Nobody. And Baker Mayfield has shown that not only did he completely lean into the, into the new culture change again, he did better. They won their first playoff game in, with a team that has traditionally been nonsense. So I do think he's actually going to be significantly better. Is he going to be Russell Wilson? Is he going to be uh, t Tom Brady? No. But is he going to show that he is the future of the Cleveland Browns? I believe that he will. And I do think he's going to take a step up this year, especially because, look, he's playing for that contract. Joey, I think that's a hell of a point, your last one. Golly, and that kind of kind of flies in the way of my argument for the, the Jets. Jeez. I I'll say this, and then I'm, I'm done. It is more of an indictment on Baker Mayfield and his pro career if he doesn't take a tremendous step forward than if he did. It would be a bigger disappointment and a bigger surprise if Baker Mayfield did not take a step forward, a tremendous step forward, than it would be actually anything else. So to me, looking at Baker Mayfield and the situation that he's in, regardless of the circumstances, Baker Mayfield did lead this team to the playoffs and to a win over the Pittsburgh Steelers. And in fact, they were competitive Lead. in the game that they lost. Oh, for certain. For certain. Lead? There was balance. Lead? There was, oh, yeah. Le led. Th let me tell you something. He had guys like Troy Aikman and Joe Buck on camera talking about a franchise Hall of Fame caliber quarterback in Baker Mayfield. That happened on a telecast, uh, on a on a live color color commentary. We all make mistakes on TV, LeVar. Well, it happens. I mean, you know, they I trust what they say. I think they got a lot of credibility really? in, in this. Yes. No, no, wait, what? Baker Mayfield is a Hall of Fame quarterback. No, I, I didn't say that. You're willing a Hall to put your stamp on that right now. I said Baker that he will make a tremendous step forward. And to do that in Cleveland, as Joy just mentioned, for them to be the catalyst of a revive and a rebuild in Cleveland is pretty phenomenal all in itself, considering that the dysfunction there has been at a massive proportion. That's all I'll say on that. But speaking of another quarterback, Rick, 4-2. Coming up, Lamar Jackson and Russell Wilson. They had a big slide in the NFL Top 100 ranking. But we'll tell you which QB's drop was, well, more surprising. Next on Speak for Your Sales. NFL Network revealed more of their top 100 lists Sunday, and there were a couple big surprises. Lamar Jackson was number one overall last year, but was number 24 this time around. Russell Wilson was second overall last year, but dropped to number 12. So, Joy... Who had the more surprising drop between the two, Lamar or Russell? Well, I think it's Lamar, one, because it's, it's a much bigger drop from 1 to 24. Russell's only 2 to 12. But Lamar, you know, came down to earth a little bit from that 2019 season and not anything dramatic. I think he's still a top player. They clearly still feel like he's a top player in this league. He's in the top 25, which is still a great thing. They just don't feel like he's the best player in the league at this point. And I think that's totally fair. But 1 to 24 is a, is a significant drop. I still think he is, has huge potential, and they clearly do too. But it is a big drop from 1 to 24. And I think that that's reflective of his numbers. I mean, in 2019, he had 36 touchdowns to six interceptions. In 2020, 26 to nine interceptions. 
you know, his rushing touchdowns were the same. His passer rating went down pretty significantly and his completion percentage went down as well. So he did take a little bit of a step back, if you want to call it that, as far as his statistics go. But he's still in the top 25 in the league. Nothing to go crazy about. Maybe a little motivation if he wants to look at it that way. But being 1 to 24, it's a more uh, shocking drop. So for all of that drop off, that's why I would say that it's actually Russell Wilson, because I can at least look at Lamar Jackson's performance and say that it took a significant dip from being the MVP of the league, as opposed to Russell Wilson, where if you look at the numbers last year, overall, he actually had a better season. Yes, his uh, passer rating came down a point. But his QBR actually went up. And a lot of the other uh, categories, his numbers actually went up. So for him to drop 10 spots, to me, is harder to reconcile than the dip that Lamar Jackson took. All right, so I'm looking at Tom Brady's stats. He had a 65%. Is he in this conversation? I did, I I'm going to tell you why he is in this conversation, sir. The reason why he's in this conversation is we're sitting there and we have a guy that made the top 10, the top 10. And, and this, this player voted, player voted list that had a 65.7 passer rating, QB rating. He's top 10. Like they won the Super Bowl. But does the Super Bowl justify a player's greatness? Yeah, it does. It does. But in this case, there was more so other elements, in my opinion, that would lead to saying that how is Tom Brady in the top 10 of this list and how does Lamar Jackson fall all the way from 1 to 24 during the course of one season? That just doesn't, that doesn't add up to me. You don't go from being 1 to 24 unless there's some type of crazy drop-off in terms of performance. I'm looking, I'm looking for your point, and I, I haven't... I, well, the, the point is, is how do you justify putting a 65% passing quarterback in the top 10 because of a Super Bowl, then you should have you should have more receivers. You should have more players from the Tampa Bay Buccaneers team in the top in the top list of this 100 players is what I'm saying. I don't find it to be justified to put him in the top 10 and have a guy like Lamar Jackson at the talent level he's at at this early in his career drop so far in the ratings. 24th from one? You're basically saying this guy is not a top 10, top five. Is Josh Allen better than Lamar Jackson today? Is he a better quarterback today? Is it debated? Is it yeah. debatable? Is it debatable? It's debatable. Well, Josh no. Allen's in the top 10 as well. How is, how, is, how is Lamar Jackson not? All right. Speaking of greats, coming up next, LeBron and Steph. Who would you want to play with more? We'll answer that next on Speak for Yourself. JaVale McGee has won NBA titles with LeBron and Steph Curry, but when he was asked who he enjoyed playing with more, he said, quote, I would probably say LeBron the first year I was on the Lakers. So, Rick, would you rather play with LeBron or Steph? I would rather play with Steph Curry. And I don't say that to be argumentative for the fact that I live in the Bay Area or to suggest that he's the better player. But I look at the way that Steph Curry treats the players around him, the lesser players around him. And he took this group of G League players last year and just fused all the confidence in the world. LeBron James, if he has last year's Warriors team, he has them all traded yesterday, okay? He's taking a completely different approach. So I'm going to assume in this equation that I am not anywhere uh, close to as good as either LeBron or Steph, and I need them to be nice to me. What a and great long-winded And the chances answer, are Rick. that Steph is going to be nicer to me than LeBron is. LeBron, Joy. Yeah, I'm also going with... <laughs> LeBron, we'll discuss that maybe tomorrow. We'll see you then. <laughs> hey, let me... Wait. Wait, wait. Wait, it mean? was a pump fake. <laughs> oh, no. They played I, played, they played I played with Deion Sanders and Bruce <laughs> Smith. I have, I have real information and knowledge on playing with Goat of Goats, and most people would want to choose who they play with in the league, maybe Tom Brady or somebody. I got a chance to play with prime Deion Sanders. Take that for what it's worth. So I'm an authority on this. It's LeBron James. What? What? Does Deion Sanders have to do with LeBron and Steph Curry? He's a GOAT. Okay, once again, I'm going to go with LeBron. That's a brush. 
He's a goat. We'll see you tomorrow. He's a goat. <laughs>